my hunch to be checked out so we don't have enough information you're right but there are things that I go on and explore with Jane to see does this make sense to you it makes sense because it's an artificial situation because we, we don't have a choice in this because we're only get because we're only given the fact and we don't have fact, a but I think I think it's because we're trying to do a formulation rather than answer those questions mm -hmm. fair enough well I yeah. <laughs> One of the things I picked up on from the case history is that right at the start it's mentioned that the school she attended had a significant drug problem and then in the penultimate paragraph, as a result Jane has never considered coming off medication so I submit that she had a kind of a drug problem, that, it, that the drugs the drugs might have been a sock to her feelings of ill-being. She has never considered coming off because she has an understanding that her depression is a chemical imbalance yeah. that the medication counteracts. Rather than the medication than being, than being a short-term yeah, yeah. assistance while she deals with, and, with and the yet underlying wouldn't you challenge. subscribe to the view that uh, medication merely replaces one kind of chemical imbalance? <laughs> with a counteracting chemical imbalance of its own. Uh, well, I'm not sure that I subscribe to the chemical imbalance theory at all. <laughs> no, I don't what, subscribe what I would to it. Su suggest or no, I how think I it's sometimes nice. find clients um, find the medication useful is that it sometimes helps manage some of the symptoms while you create yeah. the place and the space to be able to look at some of the stuff that's been very difficult. And also these drug, drug problems, if you like, are very different. This is one that's, you know, recreational that has been instigated by the teenagers, or this is something that's come from a professional that she's, who's judged as known better than her. I wonder if her thinking might be changed if she was told that there appears to be no definite proof that medication actually works. It may merely be the passage of time, the changing of circumstances like the changing of the seasons. But that might be one of the strategies which a friend or family member yeah. might employ to help her think about it a bit more, to give signposts to some of the information. But it's, it's difficult, isn't it, as to how to do that in a way that somebody's going to hear. And if we yeah. thought about the three, three stage intervention, that would be part of that sort of first step of educational. But you'd need to, I guess, do that very carefully because you can't sort of knock out the things that she's interested and held on to without quite a lot of careful preparation, can you? So yes. her acceptance of the diagnosis, in a way, is quite an important might be quite an important sort of I felt that she's hanging on to yes, it's and not to, me, it's to take not away her own. trust in her GP might might, might reinforce what she thinks about men. Dep yeah. Depends also how she sees treatment. I mean she might see it as a form of control and may feel at the time of her crisis that her life has somehow got out, out of control. She does have this sense of being quite powerless and, and being told what to do or looking to these professionals to tell her what to do, never question the diagnosis, never question the medication, um, the Prozac itself is known to have some side effects of sort of flattening emotions. So in the last paragraph, she's looking to the counsellor for answers. It'd be really sort of interesting to explore what she expects of a counsellor, doesn't she? Because, of, again, my hunch that she's got this past history of just accepting that power. It, it feels a bit like she's been sent for counselling, yes. doesn't it, rather than it's something she's decided for herself so that she wants to pursue. This issue of power 
certainly seems to have had a big impact on her sense of self-esteem. So arguably the, the imposition of the diagnosis is reinforcing this um, power over her that she's subject to. So question number one, how might Jane's diagnosis impact on how she sees herself, her difficulties and her relationships? And, and any thoughts from anyone? The diagnosis and confirmed to her her kind of inadequacy, the fact that she's a broken person, yeah. um, there's not something wrong with her, and that might confirm some, some negative beliefs she might have about herself. This could be experienced as there really is something wrong with me. I'm really not quite like other people. I, you know, I really shouldn't be feeling like this. And I was just going to say that she might feel that she was doomed to stay on medication. Um, yeah. We talked about the fact that there was no motivation to ever come off the medication yeah. um, because she felt that the chemical imbalance, so she has to stay on medication to make sure that, that balance stays there. Yes, so she may have a feeling of, you know, this is me forever on drugs to correct the imbalance. It's interesting, the imbalance never actually gets corrected, does it? No one ever says, it's correct now, you can come off it. So that could be part of what she feels. Perhaps as well as what we've said, it might at some level feel like relief, comfort, what somebody understands, somebody's listened, it's not my fault. And that's part of the trap, isn't it? It's not all bad, is it? Some of, some of it can be experienced as helpful. Part of a, it might be part of a belief system. Yeah, so so. she just now believes that that's the way she is because that's what she's been told by the professionals. Yeah. It's a powerful message from an expert, isn't it? So it's almost certainly going to become part of the way she sees herself, isn't it? A belief about herself that may be quite hard to shift. And even beliefs that are uncomfortable, people can be quite reluctant to let them go because it becomes part of you. You know, it's a big change. It can be challenging. How might she see her difficulties then? I think that's implicit in some of what people have said, but how might she see her difficulties? So, sorry, yes. It just closes down the discussion on everything else, really. So she's seeing herself in a medical context, so relationships and other things are just, it's like yeah. they're discounted almost. It tends to obscure the context, doesn't it? The problem is something inside me, perhaps inside my head, perhaps inside my brain. It's less to do with relationships and social contexts and what's gone on in her life, yeah. Yes. Yes. This this way of defining them leaves her quite stuck, doesn't it? Depend on the expert advice, because it's an illness. That's not up to you to, to sort out. Yes. Yeah, the distinction between the, the use of the word clinical depression as well makes it sound like it can only be treated with medication. Yeah. Quite mm. Yeah. Clinical depression sounds worse than just, yeah. you know, depression's to some extent a kind of lay term, isn't it? I feel depressed. Clinical depression, major depression, now that sounds serious, doesn't it? That sounds like it's some different kind of experience from the sort of things that most people go through. Mm. I'm wondering if she's feeling very insular and very lonely about her diagnosis and feeling not that it makes her special, but that it <coughs> separates her from society. I think that's a very good point. The point is she's already feeling quite lonely and isolated, and the diagnosis <coughs> could have the effect of reinforcing that. There's something different from me. I feel separate. Is this something I can, can tell people? Is it something I have to keep secret? And the other side of that sometimes is it sort of introduces you to a community of other people, possibly with the same diagnosis. And of course that can be helpful, but it comes at a price, doesn't it? We all share this kind of devalued identity. Yeah. Also that uh, the diagnosis could rob Jane of the opportunity to get to know herself better, to understand yeah. who she yeah. really is. It could be a barrier to the process of finding out who I am and what I want, Yeah, because it closes off other ways of thinking. Really excellent suggestions. Pros and cons, it sounds like overall we feel there are disadvantages, but it's really important to notice that there must, might be some advantages, both short term and long term, and we need to take that into account in people's thinking and in what alternatives you might offer. <laughs> Counselor, even if the counselor mm. doesn't have that view. Mm. Mm. So, just mm. helping to manage her illness rather than mm. helping her to feel different or feel better. Yeah.
Well, and she's she's definitely looking for answers. It doesn't mm-hmm. doesn't express the question, but she's mm-hmm. looking for answers. I don't know if the answers are why is she there, mm-hmm. who made the appointment for her to be there, yeah. or answers a little deeper as to mm-hmm. you know, can you help me mm-hmm. to get out of this? It must make you wonder why I go and see a counsellor. You know, it must make you wonder what can they do? So I've got this you know, mm. illness, it's obviously genetic or something just wrong with yeah. me. And so well, how could a counsellor help anyway? So I'm not, I'm thinking it can make her feel, um, I imagine she'd then struggle to engage maybe, or she wouldn't feel too hopeful about you know, what could be done. Or mm. yeah. It must be like reinforcing, well, this is a disease. Mm. It's something I have no control over. Mums. Uh, you know, the person that I would look to is saying mm. it's this and I need to have it treated. So mm. it's, yeah, so how does she then break away from that and think actually there's something else that can be done here? Mm. Mm. But it depends on the context, mm. like you were saying about how did she get referred. Mm. She probably wouldn't feel empowered to ask what she really wants to know or, or even confident. know what she wants yeah. to know. Confident mm. enough to ask those questions, mm. to question. Yeah, we can even have those questions. Think it could work the other way for her. Mm. But you know, I've got this, therefore I now can go and get something done about it. Mm. Is it possible it could work the other way? Um, how might Jane's acceptance of a diagnosis affect the counselling process? So she's seen a counsellor four or five times. How might it affect that ongoing process? Yes. She doesn't understand. She doesn't even understand why she's actually at counselling. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. There's, it says in the case history she doesn't really know why she's there, so there's a sense of her being passed around like a parcel. Maybe the GP referred her, I'll prescribe you this, and I'll refer you to this counsellor. And in none of this does it sound like she's really an part, active part of the decision. That's not a good basis for the counselling relationship, is it? So I guess we hope that the four or five sessions so far are part of trying to establish a contract, if you like. Otherwise, the counsellor becomes part of that same disempowering process, however good their intentions are. GPs do refer people to counselling, even at the same time as they're telling them it's a biochemical imbalance and the medication, which never does help, will help. <laughs> it's very curious, but the whole thing is to make a confusing mixed message, isn't it? You know, what, it, what is this about? How am I understanding the problem? What, what is my role in this? And these things are rarely unpicked. In, is this a fair point in counselling therapy? I'm clued by a professional. I think these things are rarely unpicked, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sometimes the medication might actually, if combined with therapy, might allow a break in her patterns so that there's a chance that she could experiment with doing some things differently. Okay, so one of the consequences of the diagnosis of the medication, so the suggestion is the medication might be a help in allowing her to actually use the therapy, which it might be, and I don't. I think the question of medication and therapy is a complicated one, because I think for some people it does help them to get to a place where they can use therapy better, and I think for other people, or perhaps the same people at different times, you know, it works insofar as it works by cutting off people from their feelings. Now, if your feelings are so absolutely overwhelming you can't engage with therapy at all, that's not helpful. But if actually your feelings could be manageable, then actually for counselling and therapy you need to access your feelings, don't you? And I think it's easy to fall into the trap of this person isn't motivated, isn't working, doesn't be seen in the room without realising the role that medication plays. So the moral, I think, is to have the conversation about medication, isn't it? And again, I think that is all of our business. You know, we're not medically trained, most of us in this room. But it is our job, I think, to make sure we have conversations about the pros and cons of medication for someone else's job to adjust the prescription or whatever. It could actually diminish her perception of the counsellor's competence or mm-hmm. knowledge or ability to help her because they're not part of this mysterious world of experts yeah. and they're not buying into that model. And she could actually feel resentful or, mm. you know... Yeah. That's an interesting point. Depending on how much she's taken on the medical model understanding, she may feel the counsellor is in, you know, a sort of inferior sort of professional who doesn't understand the complicated issue of mental illness and she still has to see someone separately about mental illness. 
and that gives the council a kind of lesser role, doesn't it? And possibly takes away some of the, you know, some of the helpful, some of the way she could perceive the council as being helpful. Yes. And perhaps on how the council is predisposed as a medical model or or if they've been on one of your courses. Um, if only they all have. Yeah. Uh -huh. As to how that might work. Well, we're kind of assuming that the council has a particular model, but the camp councillors have a range of models, which is partly why we're having this day, isn't it, to open up possibilities. So there's various possible combinations of the, you know, councillor has accepted the biomedic model too, she's, we've talked about unhelpful aspects, councillor is likely to be kind of, you know, at the very least kind of colluding with that on being less aware of that and not challenging it. Councillor doesn't buy into the biomedical model, councillor's got a more difficult job on their hands. She may have quite different, perhaps conflicting, perhaps varying perceptions of the councillor. Now suppose this is someone who's been quite entangled in services, we're assuming Jane hasn't really, she's just got as far as her GP. That is a complicated relationship because she may be getting very different messages from different bits of the system. She may see the councillor as kind of fringe benefit, who's not really doing the important work, or she may, you know, there may be quite different messages coming to her from the councillor and from her team. You know, all sorts of complicated things can happen to do with a clash of models really. But this would be kind of in my mind. These are the kind of areas we need to at least give some coverage to. So, in thinking about Jane and any client, in fact, attachment difficulties, early relationships, in other words, and their impact, trauma history. Is there a trauma history? What kind of trauma history is there? Transference and counter transference, jargon terms, the relationship that Jane is likely to have with the counsellor in this case because this team's lucky enough to have a councillor in fact it has about 40 councillors in it, and uh, the relationship that, uh, the feelings that the councillor is likely to have about Jane, which are likely in some respect, respects to repeat early relationships or have echoes of early relationships. <coughs> Social circumstances, really important part of people's everyday lives, cultural factors, supports and strengths, this is not just going to be about what's wrong with her or what's right with her, how this person understands the difficulties, have they bought into the kind of sick role, medical model stuff, and how, what role medication might be playing in this. So we need to at least give some coverage to all those issues. What do we think might be going on for Jane? Any guess is a good guess. There's no such thing as a wrong guess. Anyone can make a guess, counsellor or otherwise? Sorry, insecure attachments, very good. So insecure attachments with this kind of rather scary dad, she's not likely to feel secure comfortable relationship with him, but there are some suggestions that for whatever reason there may have been some problems in the relationship with mum as well. That's mum's own difficulty, she didn't feel able to confide in mum. So altogether, and what, what effect might that have? So I'm going to follow some of these through before picking up the next points. Feelings of insignificance. Very good. See, you don't have to be a counsellor, do you? Feeling of insignificance, translate it into <coughs> counsellees, self-worth. <coughs> It's going to make her feel not so good about herself, isn't it? Not safe. Unsafe. Insecure. insecure. Lack of confidence. Unsafe. Insecure. Intimacy is quite difficult and scary. Closeness is scary. Too, too short, and she found it difficult to commit. She felt lonely. So it's that anxiety about safety perhaps to lose her. Yeah. So insecure, unsafe, partly because of dad, because of insecure attachments. <laughs> Adds up to a feeling possibly that being close to people is scary. Yeah. And she difficult to trust. Please. Yes, hard to trust, and for good reasons. Why does she? Why might she find it hard to trust people? She expects people to criticise or threaten. Yes. Or people might be threatening. So this is the bullying, isn't it? Criticising, undermining, attacking. So. Shame. Shame. Sense of shame, which is a common consequence of bullying. So we start off insecure, we end up with the next, the next stage, if you like, is the, is the bullying. Let's put this in in capitals, so that's a big thing. So it's, we can already see a kind of an unhelpful cycle setting up, can't we? Is there any link between this, do you think? She starts, she feels very low in self-worth, lacking self-confidence. Yeah, so but there is, unfortunately, I think you know bullies are good at detecting vulnerability, aren't they? So it may be that the insecure attachments, you know, set up this chain of events whereby she's 
becomes more vulnerable, I don't like the word vulnerable, but bullies will sense that and they will know that they can pick on her perhaps more easily than some other people. So, so there we have another vicious circle reinforcing all these feelings. Okay, somebody else said trauma. We've talked about bullying, definitely a trauma. What other trauma? Domestic yeah, domestic, domestic violence. So what kind of effect is that likely to have had on her? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yet another horrible thing about the bullying is that it repeats a history of domestic violence, doesn't it? It's going to, she's already been exposed to threatening behaviour, which is very, very scary for a child. A child is not in a position to fight back. She probably had to survive the only way she could. We don't know quite what that was, but it's likely to be some version of, you know, hiding away or appeasing or something, isn't it? So, and here we are, it's happening again, the bullies, and so what are her options? She chooses the options she's used to, and she may have, you know, she may be wise to, it might be very risky to stand up to them.